The Omen and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Part 10. I'm not religious, he said, but I will say ten Our Fathers and ten Hail Marys that I should catch this fish. And I promise to make a pilgrimage to the Virgin of Cobre if I catch him. That is a promise. He commenced to say his prayers mechanically. Sometimes he would be so tired that he could not remember the prayer, and then he would say them fast so that they would come automatically. Hail Marys are easier to say than our fathers, he thought. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Then he added, Blessed Virgin, pray for the death of this fish, wonderful though he is. With his prayer said, and feeling much better, but suffering exactly as much, and perhaps a little more, he leant against the wood of the bow and began mechanically to work the fingers of his left hand. The sun was hot now, although the breeze was rising gently. I had better repeat that little line out over the stern, he said. If the fish decides to stay another night, I will need to eat again, and the water is low in the bottle. I don't think I can get anything but a dove in here, but if I eat him fresh enough, he won't be bad. I wish a flying fish would come on board tonight, but I have no light to attract them. A flying fish is excellent to eat raw, and I would not have to cut him up. I must save all my strength now. Christ, I didn't know he was so big. I'll kill him though, he said, in all his greatness and his glory. Although it is unjust, he thought, but I will show him what a man can do and what a man endures. I told the boy I was a strange old man, he said. Now is when I must prove it. The thousand times that he had proved it meant nothing. Now he was proving it again. Each time was a new time, and he never thought about the past when he was doing it. I wish he'd sleep, and I could sleep and dream about the lions, he thought. Why are the lions the main thing that is left? Don't think. Oh man, he said to himself, rest gently now against the wood, and think of nothing. He is working. Work as little as you can. It was getting into the afternoon, and the boat still moved slowly and steadily. But there was an added drag now from the easterly breeze, and the old man rode gently with the small sea, and the hood of the cord across his back came to him easily and smoothly. Once in the afternoon, the line started to rise again, but the fish only continued to swim at a slightly higher level. The sun was on the old man's left arm and shoulder and on his back, so he knew the fish had turned east of north. Now that he had seen him once, he could picture the fish swimming in the water with his purple pectoral fins set wide as wings and the great erect tail slicing through the dark. I wonder how much he sees at that staff, the old man thought. His eye is huge as a horse, with much less eye, can see in the dark. Once I could see quite well in the dark, not in the absolute dark, but almost as a cat sees. The sun and his steady movement of his fingers had uncramped his left hand now completely and he began to shift more of the strain to it, and he struck the muscle of his back to shift the hurt of the cord a little. 
If you're not tired, fish, he said aloud, you must be very strange. He felt very tired now, and he knew the night would come soon. And he tried to think of other things. He thought of the big leaks. To him, they were the grand niggers, and he knew that the Yankees of New York were playing the Tigers of Detroit. This is the second day now that I do not know the result of the Huegos, he thought. But I must have confidence, and I must be worthy of the great DiMaggio, who does all things perfectly, even with the pain of the bone spur in his heel. What is a bone spur? he asked himself. We do not have them. Can it be as painful as the spur of a fighting cock in one's heel? I do not think I could endure that, or the loss of the eye, and of both eyes, and continue to fight as the fighting cocks do. Man is not much beside the great birds and beasts. Still, I would rather be that beast down there in the darkness of the sea. Unless sharks come, he said aloud. If sharks come, God pity him and me. Do you believe the great DiMaggio would stay with a fish as long as I will stay with this one? He thought. I am sure he would and more, since he is young and strong. Also, his father was a fisherman, but would the bone spur hurt him too much? I do not know, he said aloud. I never had a bone spur. As the sun set, he remembered, to give himself more confidence, the time in the tavern at Casablanca when he had played the hang game with the great negro from Cienfuegos, who was the strongest man on the docks. They had gone one day and one night, with their elbows on the chalk line on the table, and their forearms straight up, and their hands gripped tight. Each one was trying to force the other's hand down onto the table. There was much betting, and people went in and out of the room under the kerosene lights, and he had to look at the arm and hand of the negro and at the negro's face. They changed the reveries every four hours after the first eight, so that the reveries could sleep. Blood came out from under the fingernails of both his and the negro's hands, and they looked each other in the eye and as their hands and forearms and the batters went in and out of the room, and sat on high chairs against the wall and watched. The walls were painted bright blue, and were of wood, and the lamps threw their shadows against them. The negro's shadow was huge, and it moved on the wall as the breeze moved the lamps. The oars were changed back and forth all night and they fetched the negro rum and lighted cigarettes for him. Then the negro, after the rum, would try it for a tremendous effort, and once he had the old man, who was not an old man then, but was Santiago el Campion, nearly three inches off pardons. But the old man had raised his hand up to dead even again. He was sure then that he had the negro, who was a fine man and a great athlete, beat him. And at daylight, when the betters were asking that it be caught a draw, and the reverie was shaking his head, he had unleashed his effort and forced the hand of the negro down and down until it rested on the wood. The match had started on a Sunday morning and ended on a Monday morning. Many of the betters had asked for a draw, because they had to go to work on the docks loading sacks of sugar or at the Havana Coal Company. Otherwise, everyone would have wanted it to go to a finish. But he had finished it anyway, and before anyone had to go to work. For a long time after that, everyone had called him the champion, 
and there had been a return match in the spring, but not much money was bet, and he had won it quite easily, since he had broken the confidence of the Negro from Cienfuegos in the first match. After that, he had a few matches and then no more. He decided that he could beat anyone if he wanted to badly enough, and he decided that it was bad for his right hand for fishing. He had tried a few practice matches with his left hand, but his left hand had always been a traitor, and would not do what he called on it to do, and he did not trust it. Thank you for watching. This is the end of part 10, to be continued in part 11. If you like this story, please like, share, and subscribe. See you then.